Thank you for joining me. Um, I'm going to give a lecture today which is based on a lecture I gave to the Zoological Society of Assam in August 2020. Uh, they asked me to lecture on anything and I chose as a subject the issue which I feel is most important in terms of what's going on today and that is really where are humans going and to understand where humans are going we've got to understand where they've come from. So my title is humans as an intelligent species where have they come from where are they going we know where they come from but we don't know where they're going but we can make some guesses my story starts here footsteps in volcanic ash in tanzania at least three and a half million years ago here's an obvious human-like footstep and here's a track of them walking through the ash and alongside another set of smaller tracks obviously somebody an adult walking with the child not only walking with the child but walking hand in hand humans are the only living mammal that habitually walks on two legs and our human ancestors have been walking on two legs for the last three and a half four million years or so walking on two legs had consequences one was we've already seen it frees up the hands and we'll see what the hands do in a minute but the other consequence is on the rest of the skeleton because you change the center of gravity the center of gravity in a quadruped down here goes depending on how it walks but essentially through the center of the body so the weight is equally distributed between the four limbs but as soon as you start the weight coming down just through the hind limbs then you change what those hind limbs have got to support and what the pelvis has to support and you change the whole structure of the pelvis so today we're like this upright human beings free hands with the weight coming all the way down central gravity coming down through the pelvis and then through the long bones of the legs let's add in one more thing brain expansion Homo sapiens, we have a big brain. We think we're very intelligent. Here we are up here. This is looking at brain expansion over the last three and a half, four million years or so in various hominid species. Bipedalism, standing on two legs, started three and a half, four million years ago. And we can see that if we look at the cranial capacity, it's slowly increased up to the present day. Here we are. And here Neanderthals were well, with an average cranial capacity actually a bit bigger than Homo sapiens. The change in structure of the pelvis, here's one of a chimpanzee, here's one of humans, has implications when we consider birth and the size of the head. The head contains the brain and as we've seen during evolution the brain of hominids increased in size. Now let's look at a chimpanzee first. Here's the head of the baby chimpanzee relative to the size of the chimpanzee pelvis. And we can see that, in fact, there's no problem with the baby being born. What about humans? So this is the pelvis of a woman. And it's actually not just a hole. It's, it's more like a channel where the inlet and the outlet which actually change shape and of slightly different sizes, dimensions, but we're dealing with dimensions of about 12 by 10 centimeters. Here we are, 11 and a half by 12 and a half centimeters. So what size is the baby? Well, here we are. The head of a baby is about 10 centimeters. The shoulders are about 12 centimeters. So we can see there's a very close fit between this and this. And human brain size at birth is limited by the size of the pelvis. The head can't get any bigger than this, really, because it wouldn't come out. So what we've just seen is that human brain size at birth is limited by the size of the pelvis. Here we have the brain size during childhood, and we can see there's an enormous increase, a fourfold increase in brain size as children develop. This fourfold increase in brain size has consequences. 
Firstly, children are relatively helpless at birth. They need a lot of support. There's a lot of neuroplasticity as the brain increases in volume. And that neuroplasticity allows a lot of learning to take place. And there's a need for parental and society support in that learning process. So we have consequences of human brain size being limited by the size of the pelvis, consequences in terms of a long childhood and a lot of support given by society. So now let's look at what happens next. What did humans do with their big brains and their free hands? Well, now that the hands were no longer required for locomotion on the ground, then they were free to start using these to hold tools of various kinds, sticks, stones, anything. You could manipulate things with these, with these tools, especially with the opposable thumb. And here are some of the earliest stone tools from which have been found in Kenya. Uh, they look pretty crude, but it didn't take too long before far more sophisticated ones came along. Let's put the whole thing in the perspective now. Here we have our time base along here against brain expansion up here. So the first thing was walking on two legs, which freed up the hands. And then brain expansion followed that. The freed up hands were allowed the development of tools. Uh, the brain expansion also developed, allowed the further development of language. Fire was the next thing. The use of fire, probably discovered just um, by accident, essentially because of uh, lightning strikes, but it became clear that fire could be used for two things. One is heating and protection from wild animals, protection from wild animals, uh, heat um, in the cold nights, and to allow expansion into colder environments, but also this one, unlocking the energy in food, particularly plant food, rich in carbohydrates, but those carbohydrates may be largely inaccessible unless they're cooked first. Cooking was also a social affair which probably expanded the use of language and uh, social uh, skills generally. The controlled use of fire probably came much later and much more near the present time where fire could be uh, built up uh, using fuels which could be gathered locally. Um, so we're using energy here from the sun which has been pouring down onto trees and other vegetation for many years and then we suddenly unlock it for fire which we could use for various purposes not just for cooking and what we're going to be looking at in a minute is what the energy in fuel in wood could be used for. So the use of fire was fundamental in human development for unlocking energy, energy in food plant food particularly, plant food where the energy had come from the sun over the last season or so, and in actually uh, allowing energy for the fuel of the fire itself, energy from plants, from wood, which had been stored up from the sun again over many years or maybe decades, maybe hundreds of years. And there's a very good um, review article, The Discovery of Fire by Humans, a long and convoluted process, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, uh, Series B, in 2016. The real game changer, though, was this. The ability of our brains to control our hands and to use tools was fine, but they were limited by muscle power. The game changer was to accentuate, improve on muscle power by using stored energy in plant materials to burn. You could release the energy in wood or coal or oil, which had been taken tens, hundreds of years to accumulate. You could release that energy in a few minutes or a few seconds to power machines. That power from the sun could be used to power machines in industry. These massive looms are being powered not by the children, but by burning fossil fuels. All the children are doing are using their brains, their hands, their skills to, to control the machines. 
that powered machines could be used to exploit more energy resources, particularly oil and coal, energy which had been stored up over millions of years. Fossil fuels, energy from the sun, stored in plant material initially, and then stored underground in deposits of oil and coal. The machines and the energy sources could then be used to a whole variety of purposes in agriculture, using bigger and bigger machines to exploit more and more land and more and more food sources, and in equipment to store, process and transport food. Transport by land, by sea, by air, to build massive cities, the infrastructure of the human population today, and to transport power from one place to another. And that power could also be used to transform raw materials, the oil, the natural gas, air, water, metals, minerals, into many, many different products, products everything from plastics through to glass, textiles, paints, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, using stored energy. And we could use the power in technology tools, actually now to expand our own brain power, but also in terms of communication and exploration. Exploration of what? Everything from the largest structures in the universe down to the very smallest things and looking inside our own bodies. And we mustn't forget this, the uses of power in weapons of destruction to protect ourselves, but also to destroy other things. Well, given what humans have managed to achieve, have humans actually been successful? Let's have a look. Well, they've certainly been successful in terms of populating the planet. Humans probably came out of Africa about 200,000 years ago, and they populated Asia over down to Australia 50,000 years ago, over into the Americas about 35,000 years ago, into Europe as well about the same time. And not only that, they populated every part of the planet from the coldest, the driest, the hottest, the highest, the wettest. And they did that because they could control their own local physical environment by building things, by building protection from the weather, by harvesting water, by harvesting food, using their brains, their hands, fire, and simple tools. Let's look at things in a slightly different way looking at how the world's population has changed and also some of the technological advances which have been underlying the changes in the human population. In terms of the time base, we're dealing with time base along here in terms of thousands of years, 10,000 years before the current era. The current era started in year zero and we're now up to 2020 here. Back at the um, 10,000 years before current era, then there were about 4 million people on the planet. And we can see the red line shows there was very little increase for some time. We're going to see what happens in this period in a few minutes. Let's go back to the start. World population, 4 million people, what were they doing? Well, this was the beginning of settled agriculture. So the hunter-gatherer existence was also beginning to transform into uh, pockets of settled agriculture with animal domestication setting in. It wasn't until about 5,000 years before the current era that the development of other tools uh, which could help um, agriculture and building, levers and wheels started coming in. Bronze Age came in about 4,000 years before the current era, Iron Age more recently, and in just 250 years ago, major developments associated with the use of those powered machines in terms of the Industrial Revolution. And we can now see that the 
world's population is just beginning to pick up. And then it takes off. It takes off very rapidly. Two billion people in 1928. When I was born, it was about two and a half billion people in 1950. Three billion people in 1960. Five billion in 1987. Seven billion in 2011. And about 7.8 billion today, 2020. What's been fueling all this? Well, we said the Industrial Revolution, we could start seeing the beginnings of um, the world's population taking up. So that was allowing the use of machines to really exploit many of the uh, planet's resources and to use the power to make things and to process food and to transport things. At the same time, there was an agricultural revolution taking place in terms of understanding crop rotation, understanding selective breeding, increasing mechanization. 1800s onwards, then other technological advances, cleaner water supplies, improving human health, vaccines, improving human health, antiseptics, improving human health. And then in the current era, we've got pesticides, fungicides, genetic ma manipulation, all increasing agricultural productivity, globalization of resources, allowing food and other resources to be uh, transported all around the planet. Antibiotics, another major thing in terms of increasing human health. So what we've seen over the last, particularly the last 250 years, but also more slowly before that, increasing control of the physical and biotic environment by humans' ability to use tools and to use stored energy sources to manipulate the various resources they could get hold of. So we started off by saying humans are an intelligent species. Where they come from, we've been looking at that. The next question, we've seen where they've come from, where are they going to go now? Where are they going to go now? Let's have a look. So here we are today. Here we have our planet. And on the planet, we have 7.8 billion people, which over the last 250 years or so, a number of those people have increased remarkably with their increasing control of the local environment. Now, this picture of the planet in which we're living, I think, is a bit of uh, misleading. Here's our iconic picture of the globe, but it gives a false impression, I feel, of what really sustains life. Yes, it looks like a big globe and a big globe with obviously a lot of volume, but it's not the volume of the planet which sustains life. Life is dependent on just a very thin shell at its surface, a very thin shell, just like uh, uh, the dry skin of an onion. It's very, very thin. The atmosphere is very thin, maybe eight kilometers or so of atmosphere. And life is only sustainable in the first 10 meters of the ocean in terms of depth, because that's the uh, part which uh, light really penetrates. And there's relatively little uh, land surface in which life, particularly plant life, can survive because much of it is too dry or too cold. So life is dependent on just a very thin shell, very thin shell of air, water and land in the crust of the whole planet. And life in those that critical zone is altered by a number of things. Solar radiation coming in, geochemical and geological activity of the planet, and for the last four and a half billion years or so, biological activity, especially in the early days with bacteria and then plants, and then animals, and now particularly humans. If we look at the biomass of all life on the earth today, then 82% of it is plants. There's a lot of bacteria, 5% of everything else, including humans, but humans look just a tiny percentage of the earth's total biomass. But that tiny percentage of biomass 
has had immense implications in terms of what the Earth can do. Humans may represent only a tiny percentage of the total biomass of all living things on the planet, but they represent a significant part of the biomass of mammals. Humans represent a third of the whole of the biomass of mammals on the planet. And perhaps even worse than that, or even more significant, is that the animals associated with humans, in terms of domestic animals, the cattle, the pigs, the sheep, they're 65% of the total biomass. So between the two, humans and their associated animals, 97% of all mammalian biomass is human associated. Only 3% of mammalian biomass are wild animals. And the important thing about that is that while this is only a very small percentage of the total biomass of the planet, humans and their domesticated animals are changing what the planet can do. A very influential paper came out in 2009, which has really changed the way we think about things. It was called Planetary Boundaries, Guiding Human Development on a Changing Planet. And they recognise this, that the Earth has entered a new epoch, where humans constitute the dominant driver of change to the Earth system. And what Rockstrom and others did in their nature paper was to present a concept of planetary boundaries for saying, well, what is it safe that the planet can sustain? What's changing? What are the limits to the system? So they wanted to look at the safe operating uh, limits for the functioning of the Earth system. It was a very influential paper which has undergone a number of revisions and modifications uh, and some of the references are down here. Now I'll just lead you through the kind of thing that Rockstrom did. He and his colleagues looked at various things and the obvious one for which is, receives a lot of attention is climate change. And to look at climate change, he used CO2 levels in parts per million as an index about what's going on. And he said, well, we, what we can do, we know what the levels were pre-industrially, that is before the Industrial Revolution. They were about 280 parts per million. And he said, well, given what we know about climate change and the role of CO2, um, we can propose a limit, which is probably safe, of 350 parts per million. What is its current status? And the current status, when this paper was published, 10 years ago now, was 387. So it's way above the proposed limit. If we look what it is today, in 2020, in the autumn of 2020, it's 414. So it's still going up very, very rapidly. And he did a similar kind of calculation for lots of other Earth system processes. Here they are, the rate of biodiversity loss the nitrogen cycle, how much nitrogen is removed from the atmosphere for human use, particularly in terms of fertilizers, the phosphorus cycle, again, looking at fertilizers, ozone depletion, ocean acid acidification, water use, chemical pollution, chemical pollution of all kinds, uh, not just individual chemicals like uh, organic pollutants and heavy metals, and, but also things like plastics. And for all of these, they looked at what the pre-industrial levels were, what the current status was, and what the proposed limits might be. And essentially, it went like this. For most of these things, they were either exceeding the limit or very near the limit of safety. For chemical pollution at the time, it wasn't determined, but uh, one it can easily argue that it's either very near the limit or is exceeding the limit for many individual plastic pollutants, or, uh, pollutants like, for instance, plastic. Here we are. Microplastic in the Atlantic Ocean could weigh 21 million tonnes. This was 18th of August 2020. And plastics have only been around for the last 60 or 70 years. So even in that short time, we've put millions of tonnes of plastics into the ocean. And we really don't know what the long term significance of this is, except we know in many cases those plastics are harmful. And in terms of biodiversity, this graph mirrors essentially 
the graph on human population growth going up with the advent of the Industrial Revolution back here and we look at what, what's this they're all going up going up extinction rates of amphibians mammals birds reptiles fish and we forget about this because our own species is very robust we can control our environment we can survive in very harsh conditions animals can't and it isn't just the big animals it's the small ones insects insects in global decline this keeps on hitting the headline this one uh, came out in 2019 worldwide decline in the of the entofauna and we look at a whole varieties of different kinds of uh, invertebrates uh, insects in this case and we find they're dying off why because of things like intensive agriculture and widespread use of pesticides So what we can see is that here we've got human brain, the human hand, energy, tools, power systems, human development, industrial revolution, crop rotation, selective breeding, etc. Better human health, massive increase in the human population, all of which influencing these critical human processes. And we're now getting to ex the extent where they're either exceeding or nearing the limit at which the earth can sustain them. So the question is, where does Homo sapiens go from here? What's the future of the human race? The question about where we're going is relevant in terms of how many people can the planet actually sustain? The planet has got limited resources. Human population is increasing rapidly. How many people can the planet sustain? Each person on the planet consumes and pollutes. But there's a limit on how much air, water, land, productivity, etc. is there. How close are we? Well, current estimates are that if you assume a certain level of um, existence, not a high level American type, may be a bit below a comfortable European type, somewhere between subsistence and comfortable, somewhere around there, there are probably 1.6 times more people on the planet than the planet can actually support. 1.6 times more. That's now. Well, let's look at numbers first. Where is Homo sapiens going? Well, to be honest, we don't know. We know where we've come from. If we look at the actual population of the planet over the last 100, 200 years or so, we know with good evidence that it's been going up and up and up. And, up. and now in 2020, it's getting on for 8 billion, 7.8, 7.9 billion. Where's it going from now? This has been history up to now. We can make projections about what might happen, but they're all projections. We don't know which is going to be the fact. The projections go like this. Some the rate goes on and on and on and on, and some it starts coming down. And it all depends on the relative rates of fertility, how many children are born, and the death rates. Those two will determine essentially what the world's population OK, let's go back to this. Here's the time based along here, thousands of years. These are all the events leading up to the current population surge. But we've left one thing out, a critical thing, and that is the artificial control of fertility. Throughout most of this time, there was no artificial control of fertility that was really effective. And it was only in the late 1950s and then in the beginning of the 1960s that the artificial control of fertility in terms of contraception and or sterilization really came into uh, the human perspective. If we look at what's happening today, contraceptive use by women of reproductive age, then we can see that 
um, these various different colours represent different kinds of contraceptive or fertility control mechanisms, female sterilisation dark red, male sterilisation in pink, IUDs in orange, and going all the way down. And we can see that there was a high instance rate of contraceptive use in women in Eastern and South East Asia, Europe, North America, Latin America, coming down, coming down. The one where it's quite poor is really in sub-Saharan Africa and in Northern Africa and maybe Western Asia as well. But in much of the world there's fairly high prevalence of contraceptive use and that's had an effect. Well we're going to look at how the artificial control of fertility has actually impacted on human reproduction and to do that we really need to understand where human reproduction has come from. And we're going to go back to look at what our current understanding is about the ancestral human reproductive pattern. And this is well before settled agriculture came in. We're going to be looking at hunter-gatherer societies. I'm going to be using a similar kind of format in the next few slides. So let's have a look. We're dealing with a time base along here in terms of years and we're looking at the life of a woman. We'll forget about childhood, but at puberty, which starts sometime in the early teens, that's when reproductive potential really starts, but it ends again up here at the menopause. So this is age 10, 20, 30, 40. This is the potential reproductive life of a woman. After puberty, when ovulation starts, there's often a period of relative physiological infertility or subfertility for maybe a few months or a couple of years, often associated with a period of cultural infertility, where young girls don't get married or get, don't get associated with young men for a few years. But then, the so here's the first pregnancy, nine months long. What happens after that? Well, the important thing is there's lactation. Hunter-gatherer societies, um, Lactation features heavily in their lifestyle. They may breastfeed for two, three, four years or so. And the lactation is very intense. Lots of suckling periods throughout the day, often very short suckling periods, but lots of them. And those lactational, that lactation is associated with a lactational suppression of fertility. Ovulation is suppressed during the heavy lactation, which spaces out the next birth. So our understanding of the primitive hunter-gatherer societies, the primitive ancestral condition of humans, is their reproductive pattern would have looked like this. Relatively few pregnancies, spaced out because of long intervals between the pregnancies, spaced out because of lactational suppression of ovulation and fertility. Maybe only three, four or five pregnancies in their entire life. As humans began to settle down, the hunter-gatherer societies uh, disappeared and there was increasing urbanization and domestic food production. And that changed the reproductive pattern. Particularly, lactation tended to be reduced and so the lactational suppression of fertility was also reduced. With the decline of the lactational suppression of fertility with short lactations, short suppressions of fertility, the pregnancies could follow on very quickly from each other. Short intervals between pregnancies, one, maybe two years, and very easily 13, 15, even 20 pregnancies would not unexpected. Emma Darwin, Charles Darwin's life, had 13 pregnancies in her lifespan, but she only had her first birth at the age of 30. The lactational suppression of fertility, if you take it away, you have lots and lots of pregnancies. That's what human reproductive potential is. So what's the reproductive pattern today? Well, we can take the ancestral one, which then changed to the one where there was less suppression of fertility by lactation, but we can now impose on top the artificial control of fertility by contraception or sterilization.
So what we would see today in terms of the human reproductive pattern is that family planning plays a key feature. We have puberty, a little bit of physiological infertility, cultural infertility, but then the control of pregnancies by contraception or abortion. There's the first pregnancy. After that, there may or may not be lactation or suppression of fertility. Um, but even if there isn't any lactational suppression, you could control the interval between two pregnancies by more contraception. And then finally, the number of children, which are a uh, number of pregnancies and then the number of your family size, can be controlled by contraception and finally sterilisation to um, stop fertility completely. And the fact of the matter is, women are now having fewer children. This is looking at data from various parts of the world, the most up-to-date data we can have. This is, uh, comes from 2019 for different parts of the world. And we can see they're all dropping down very rapidly, where lives birth for women in the 1950s were up here, five, six, seven. Whereas now they're coming down to just two or sometimes below two. And the replacement level for a population has to be about 2.1. 2.1 births per, per woman means the population will keep fairly stable. They're all coming down, even sub-Saharan Africa. What happens now? Well, the projections go like this. Provided there is safe, effective access to contraception, plus improved access to education, because access to education, better educated women, allows them to use the safe and effective contraception, allows their con them to control their family size. This is what is predicted, with all of them coming down to near the replacement level by the end of the century. So what does this fall in birth rate do to projections of population? Well, we're looking here at the four most populous countries, as is predicted to occur in 2100, China peaking in 2020 to uh, 2030 and then coming down. The rate of coming down depends on the uh, fertility rates and the mortality rates. India the same. Nigeria, well that's a bit more difficult. Sub-Saharan Africa and Nigeria is a good example. Um, the worst case scenario it just goes on increasing but other projections say it may flatten off and start coming down. USA similar. These changes in population numbers is good news in terms of the planet because remember there are many more people on the planet than the planet can actually sustain. But it has implications. Here we see some which uh, exercise the minds particularly of politicians, the number of working age adults. And we can see that the number of working age adults, so these are productive working age people, peaks in China about now, 2020, in India uh, maybe 10, 20 years later, in Nigeria much later still, and then they start coming down. India comes down, China comes down, Nigeria is peaking at the end of the century. Now the problem with that is that working age adults supports the economy. And what politicians, especially in democracies, worry about is having healthy economies. And that depends on workers. That depends on the number of working age adults. So a number of countries around the world are wanting to stimulate birth rate. Here we are, see some headlines. 15th of January 2020, Russia's Putin seeks to stimulate the birth rate. So we can have more working age adults in the not just Russia, all over the world, Europe. Italy is a good example how Italy's new Family Act aims to increase the plunging birth rate, 12th of June 2020. There are examples of this all around the world, including in sub-Saharan Africa, where the population will be increasing fourfold over the next 60 or 80 years. In Tanzania, in 2018, the president called for an end to birth control so that there would be a greater population, a greater workforce. And not only that, more than 25% of governments worldwide want to raise fertility levels.
one would have to question whether stimulating birth rates, when we already know that the sustainable carrying capacity of the Earth has been exceeded, whether stimulating birth rates is really what an intelligent species should be doing. We know our consumption and pollution levels in terms of the numbers of people on the planet exceeds the available carrying capacity of the planet enormously. We need to change that balance. And the argument about the working population, the number of working adults and uh, the GDP of individual countries, I think is a bit of a, a, a fallacy. Let's have a look. Here we see what is known as a population pyramid. It's a population pyramid of India in the year 2000. And we can see along the bottom axis here is the percentage of each age group, which is on the vertical axis, in each age group. So we have a large number of children here below the age of 20. This is the working population. And this is the elderly. This is arbitrarily divided into the working population. That's in the year 2000. Let's have a look in 2020. Here we are. In 2020, the age structure has changed. So there's fewer young people. Those young, that bulk of young people is now working its way into the working population. And there's a very small increase in the age group. Here we have the estimates for 2100. Smaller numbers of children here. Here's the working population. Here are the aged. Now, in terms of the argument about how many people are in the uh, working population, let's have another look. In 2000, 45% were young, 50% were in the working population as we've defined it. Only a small number up here in the aged population. In 2020, those numbers have changed. That 50% in the middle has increased to 59%. A few more up here and a few less down here. The estimates for 2100, 53%. So we haven't had a big change in the numbers of people in the working population. Yes, there are more aged people support, but there are fewer younger people. So it doesn't take a lot of jiggling with the numbers in terms of changing the these, uh, what we've said here is the working population. If people work a little bit longer into old age, then we can soon keep this number of working age uh, adults in the same kind of uh, broad band. So we don't have to consider a dramatic change in the GDP. There's also the question of technology. Changing technology from 2000 to 2100, there's been enormous changes in terms of uh, information technology, in terms of robotics, um, to actually uh, stimulate birth rates on the assumption we've got to somehow keep these numbers stable is, I think, wrong. So let's go back to the original question. Humans are an intelligent species. Well, that's I know we can ask m many questions about what we mean by intelligent, but they've certainly uh, exploited the world in terms of using their brains, developing tools, uh, exploiting power sources. We've seen where they've come from. Where are they going? Well, where they're going is going to be dependent on decisions that we all make, that you make now as individuals, not only as individuals, but as part of your local and national communities, and in terms as part of the global community. All of this will determine what happens next. Please play your part. Thank you very much.